They're just giving time for people to escape for the next half an hour. That's a usual story with most of the inflammatory talks. But the good thing about it is, as it's been the trend in the last 10 years, my talk always precedes the NTEP for some reason. It at least ensures that the hall is 50% full. Uh, I still can't see my presentation, so last 30 seconds for people to escape. Uh, while we are sorting this out, I, I like to thank Dr. Chetan and uh, AOP for uh, giving me an invite to come and share a few things with you. And uh, I thank the morning 2-3 sessions for setting up a platform for this presentation of mine. The first one talked about newborns and fevers and the second one talked about bacterial nai hai to metabolic socho. I am going to probably just drive on the point of metabolic ke paad rheumatology socho. You know it's high time, Karan Arjun kabhi to aayenge na. So we will wait for Karan and Arjun to come. I thought nai hai 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 presentation. I am going to get 5 extra minutes for every second of delay that's happening here, not my fault. So when Dr. Chetan actually called me to say you are coming to Vaxicon, I said what am I going to do in Vaxicon? It's been a while since I am missing Vaxicon or vaccines. Timer ban kya to bhi chalega. Uh, okay. So actually this was where I was when I got the call from Dr. Chetan. I was probably, this is a common uh, one-liner that we use to sell rheumatology to patients. You know, horses are common than zebras. So most of our conditions are as rare as a zebra. My corollary to this is donkeys are common than horses. So we heard the donkey, sepsis, bacteria, etc. in the morning. Uh, we heard the horse in the room, tuberculosis, which is very common and uh, has to be ruled out. And then probably it's time for the zebras, right? Uh, and then I actually thought, Dr. Chetan, I, I feel very lonely amongst this group of elite seasoned horses. But then I found this nice quote where, you know, you cannot be lonely if you like the person you are alone with. And the zebra here is nothing but rheumatology and I, you could Guess by the dress code, there is one more zebra sitting in the audience, you know, the white and black. So I am happy to see Devang also in the audience. <laughs> Last thing is, uh, uh, when I think of rheumatology, you know, so yeah, we think that most rheumatics is a normal zebra, but I was thinking, what, what do I present to this audience in the next half an hour? And is it really a zebra or it's just a horse that's looking a bit unusual or and, and most of the cases that I will be discussing today are going to come to me from this set of pediatricians. So let's see. And then I said, I'm going to Ahmedabad. What can I get in return and what can I dish out? I found that the most famous street food in Ahmedabad is called a gotala. So uh, whether it's a dosa gotala or an anda gotala, I'm going to serve you a bit of, little bit of rheumatology, a bit of common things that might come handy in your practice. And, and I, I, I think Gotala is a nice and sophisticated word. So let's see if it's really uh, as tasty as. Is there a place called Manik Chok? That's on my list. And there's a guy called Palan Dosa. 270 rupees. Only two helpings of chutney and sambar. So I have to reach there. <laughs> so let's me be as quick as possible. So I decided to call it Chills, Pills, and Thrills. So I'll show you a few cases of fever from a rheumatology perspective. Touch about a few drugs that might be handy for you people and then the thrill is obviously there to experience. I don't know if the picture is clear but since we've seen these cases in the morning, uh, what's the diagnosis? All the pediatricians, if I see a bone and elbow joint which comes like this, what's the most likely diagnosis? Uh, cellulitis is a good thought but if I say it's the it's a bit deeper than that. We had this discussion in the morning, right? What do you expect the CRP in this case to be? 200 or 20? 200. 
So you all know that we can do what needs to be done with a CRP of 120. What I'm going to talk to you about is when you have something like this situation with a CRP of 20. Is it possible? Devan will not answer. Okay. So what's the condition I'm talking about? So we talked about osteomyelitis in the morning and we are by rule acute osteomyelitis will probably end up being bacterial more or more than uh, so usual. But the first important rule is when you start seeing metafacial lesions on the bone, a very basic thing to remember is, especially the students, N for metaphysis, rule out myelitis or osteomyelitis and rule out N for malignancy. That's the first lesson that I start off with. And, and the condition I'm going to talk about, there's only one Indian report from the south which talks about six cases in five years. And I, I did this presentation in Navi Mumbai and Bombay once. And ever since that presentation has happened, I, I've been able to diagnose seven cases in six months. So what am I talking about? It's a rare condition, but definitely you do see zebras. And you can have what's called as an inflammatory osteomyelitis. So the, the, let's understand these two cases. So, you know, this was a kid who orthopedician rang up saying I am referring a child with osteomyelitis. So this is a pediatric orthopedician and I am like why are you referring me an osteomyelitis? It's your baby. So he says it's, I don't think it's bacterial for a start. And then he says it's recurred three times. I said okay, now it's making sense. And he said I have operated twice. I said no, please refer him early. <laughs> and then he says different different sites. And then it's always been sterile. I have always managed to document it on histopath and osteomyelitis, but cultures are always sterile. To a bar that's the usual story. Na? Tere type ka kuch to hai. So I just want all of you to think tere type ka hai, and please refer the patients to the readers, right? So, and you know the answer is applying in exactly every single statement that is made. He says he's referring a child with osteomyelitis. So for the next half an hour, let's think that anything with an itis is inflammation. Could be infection induced, could be mycobacterial induced, but let's say inflammation. Don't think it's bacterial. I will call it non-bacterial. Recurred three times, so we'll call it a bit chronic and recurrent. And different sites means multifocal. And then in the good old Ambedkar way, it's sterile and non-infectious. Start adding it the words and you end up with a condition called chronic, recurrent, multifocal osteomyelitis. So, how many of you have not heard of CRMO? So, I'm happy to see at least 20% of people who have not heard this entity, right? But this is a non-inflammatory, sorry, it's a non-bacterial inflammatory condition. And I'm going to run through three cases to suggest the same. When do I start thinking of chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis? So this was a kid who came to me at age 15 and with a history which started at age 4 months. And the first thing which struck you was there is consanguinous marriage, which is the first thing we as pediatricians take the history. And when I saw this, this child has been having this right elbow swelling and pain and hemoglobin has always been low since birth. CRP is 10, ESR as usual not done, right? an orthopedic uh, reference was done, MRI done, consistent with osteomyelitis, went through the uh, carpentry as I call it and this child at age 4 months gets the first episode, by the time the reports on the histopath come gets an osteomyelitis in the other elbow and the surgeon wants to do a repeat procedure and the parents take Dama, go to a GP who starts him on IBUJ6 plus and the child nicely settles. And till 15 months, the child has got four episodes involving the elbows. And every time now the parents have got used to ibujesic data to keep okay. Right? And then this is the serial CBCs and investigation chart. What's striking is, you know, hemoglobin has always been low. And this child has always been worked up for iron deficiency. Which again, less than six months, you don't get iron deficiencies usually. What is very striking in the CBC is RBCs have always been low and CRPs are not that greatly elevated for a seeming bacterial osteomyelitis. So there are enough clues to start making you wonder A, consanguinity, maybe a PID in evolution or PID needs to be worked out 
or it's probably a non bacterial story. And on a nice close examination, this child also has got these kind of skin lesions and, and skin lesions over the uh, forearm, over the uh, calf. And, and I thought I knew something about it, but it's always a good idea. Go back to the head to toe examination part of it, start correcting the clues. So this child had a lot of erythematous apular lesions along with it, which the parents said, Ramuri Sarka Ahe, Janma Pasun. Right? And then, believe it or not, and nothing will happen, just give ibuprofen is the usual advice because the child is growing alright, etc., etc., the usual thing we reassure parents. But when you examine this child, after having three episodes of osteomyelitis, has got a fixed deformity, there is no full movements and there is a contracture that's setting in and you start looking at the serial X-rays and you see this nice globular hyper expansile lesion with evidence of periosteitis and hyperostosis. These are terms which the radiologist will start using and when you start seeing these kind of terms the first thing we did was do a PID workup which was essentially okay. Then you start collecting the symptoms, consignous tick, recurrent episodes of osteomyelitis which has been sterile, dermatosis of something, or I don't know the answer, let's take an expert opinion, anemia of infantile onset. So obviously that hemoglobin of 5, 5.5 with low RBC is at an infantile onset, probably should warn you that the problem is in the factory. There is a problem with the bone marrow and the normal CRP does not fit into a bacterial inflammation. So what did we do? I, I asked for a bone marrow just to figure out what's causing the anemia. And the pathologist was more than happy to teach me the whole of Harshmohan and, you know, and, and a lot of unique terms, cabot's rings, chromatin bridging. And I said, Enrique, he said he's got congenital dyserythropoietic anemia, which suddenly made sense and in rheumatology when you start seeing this the next thing I set this child up for, for a skin biopsy and the skin biopsy came back as sweet syndrome or neutrophilic dermatosis now the puzzle uh, became very easy and now you start connecting the dots chronic osteomyelitis mostly non-bacterial with neutrophilic dermatosis with congenital dyserythropoietic anemia consanguinity Put this to Google or artificial intelligence or someone who thinks he is a naturally intelligent guy in the audience like Devan. And then we will probably advise an exome sequencing. And this child tested positive for a something called as an LP2 mutation. What does LP2 mutation suggest? It is a condition called Majid syndrome. I am not talking of some hi fi stuff. Remember, India is ranks. Uh, Top in consanguinity also. I won't be surprised if you start picking up these cases because the only trouble is he came to me through the pediatric orthopedician, not through the pediatrician. But the clever pediatrician, once you start recognizing the pattern, we don't want you to recognize Majid syndrome, but at least something should strike the bell, right? So Majid syndrome is one of resonant literature to read, rare, but definitely exists in our country. This is another interesting kid, you know. Who's the guy on the left? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. No prizes for guessing. I hope this video plays because he promised me that this video will play. Yeah. This girl walks into my OPD and the mother says she's an extremely good dancer but she's doing moonwalking. She's a fan of Michael Jackson but she's walking like this. And I don't think there is any disease that any of us can think where you will have this kind of a gait. You know, problem right leg mein hai ki left leg mein hai, God only knows. And you almost, this is an adolescent girl, you think that she is just fooling around because of various stress and pain amplifications etc. But then the complaint was since she has been doing this for the last one year on and off, on and off, takes an NSAID and she gets better. Right? So you start examining this, how many of you can see what I am seeing on her face? So, excellent, Mallor Rash and what does Mallor Rash think? So she is a girl, she is 13 year old, so my usual dictum, you know, Tera Sal, L for Ladki, L for Leukopenia, possibly L for Lupus. But then she is limping morning stiffness and you see the problem on the face and you see that she has a little bit of ankle synovitis also. 
and then when you examine her, she has restricted hips and sacroiliac uh, restriction also. Again, for all these inflammatory things, her CRPs and ESRs are not that greatly high. And then we also thought of malar rash and the pediatrician already sent ANA, RA to bola yuti ka hai, ladki ho hai, ladka ho, umbilicus ke niche, you know, that's the usual, my teaching is below the umbilicus, B for boy, B for Bia, sorry, B for B27, you know, so this B27 B karke ho hai. And I am like, me kya karo hai, right? So, and then, sure enough, this child had documented hip and sacroiliac uh, involvement. Can this be an HRA B27 negative arthropathy? Probably yes. But again, a clinical examination, B27 was negative, and I found that her shin was quite tender. You know, there was pain on the shin along with the ankle joint. And then the mom went home and sent me that this is not something in the face. It was like this. What is this? We are, I am not running a dermatopedy, but this is what's more common than a butterfly rash in a 13 year old adolescent female. Acne. This is acne or acne conglobata, the fulminant form of cystic, postular, enzymatous acne. And then while this was happening, I was in the shower. Like most rheumatologists will be at home before 7 because they will be in Archimedes. Most of the diagnosis will be due in the bathtub. And then I said, please get an x-ray of the leg done because that shin was quite tender. And, and sure enough, this looks very familiar, like, like the previous skin. This is this globular, expansile, thick, you know, and again the same word, sclerosis, osteitis. And we see there is a little bit of a light inclination in the fibula also. And then when you start connecting this, life becomes very easy. You know? So spend the evening in the bathtub and start connecting the words. She has S for synovitis or sacroiliitis. She's got A for acne. She's got P for postular lesions. She's got hyperostosis. And she's got O for osteitis or periosteitis. And you add all of them and you come up with a condition called Sappho syndrome. So Sappho syndrome is also a form of chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. Sounds very savvy, but it's very, very existent in the community. And the child has given you enough clues to diagnose. The sad part is, it takes a while to start connecting the dots. And then this is what happens when you actually diagnose this girl on time. This is the same girl after, believe it or not, four weeks of NSAIDs. This girl has completely started catwalking from moonwalking, right? And the lesions have also disappeared. So the third kid is an 18-month-old boy, low fever since a month, similar story, extremely irritable on touching, doesn't want to put his uh, weight there, more nocturnal pains, but see the CBC. HB8, white cells 4000, L65, platelets 1.5 lakhs, ESR 80, CRP 50. Do you think, and, and this radiologist is extremely clever, he has reported it as CRMO. And I am like, when a radiologist report CRMO, usually it's correlated clinically. So, and then I said, let's get an x ray done. And this x ray shows very nicely. This, I don't know if you can appreciate the lower end of the ulna is sliced and destroyed completely. Do you think this is CRMO? What's the red flags in this? Is the CBC normal? Unless you are an infant, you are not allowed to be lymphocyte predominant. Rule number one. Rule number two, counts of 4000 is slightly low. Rule number two, ESR, CRP in the previous two cases were normalized or they are near just about borderline. This is a very high ESR and CRP for me. And sure enough, see the, you know, it's always a good idea. When you have a low count, Please try and connect with, with the acute phase markers. Your counts and ESR CRP going in opposite direction means there is trouble. And you, this is a picture I keep seeing in Mumbai a lot. I need to see this in Ahmedabad. But when things go in opposite directions, you are heading in for a disaster. Right? So counts low, HD low, ESR high is a problem. 
whenever you are faced with a situation, always if everything is going in one direction, you should be happy. Give me a 26,000 pounds, I don't mind if platelets are 8 lakhs. I don't want 26,000 pounds with 20,000 platelets. Similar thing with ESR. And obviously, if you give an aproxin and the child doesn't respond that well, what's the diagnosis? You will do a bone marrow and please sort out leukemia. So, the message is what? These kids respond very well to treatment. If you recognize the pattern, please rule out the donkeys and the horses before diagnosing a zebra. This is just a picture I took from uh, Google to see because the pediatrician would probably see many kids with spine. And as a rheumatologist, I don't like seeing kids with spine because first thing is obviously rule out tuberculosis. Second is a malignancy, but then CRMO can also hit the vertebra, right? And then a rare bones when you see a mandible which is swollen like this or a clavicle, right? So only, I don't think we remember anything about the clavicle other than the figure of it. You know, in a clavicular fracture, right? Somewhere in anatomy textbooks, but the other common, if you see a clavicle that is thick with uh, features suggestive of some inflammation with normal CRP. Think, in fact, clavicular involvement is a part of the criteria. When you have one clavicle which is prominent and tender with a normal CRP, think it could be a CRMO. Right? For neonatologists in particular in the audience, if you see a newborn with such kind of lesions at a, a very young age, one, one and a half, two months, with such florid skin lesions, you will start reading about conditions called deficiency of interleukin receptor, uh, one receptor called DIDA and DITRA, etc., etc., which fall into the domain of auto inflammatory disorders. So, when you see bad skin with bone in the newborn age, uh, newborn era, please think of uh, auto inflammatory disorders which can also have illness. I thought I wasted or invested 30 minutes coming all the way. Just give me exactly 7 minutes because I am going to talk some things which are important from your daily practice point of view. I will skip this part. Most of you know the approximate test. When there is PUO, fever with musculoskeletal symptoms, if it responds, in think inflammatory. Fever goes away, joint pains remain, think of a malignancy. Both remain, please intensify your search for an infection. I will skip this for want of time. Most of us know systemic arthritis very well. Most of you know my presentations very well. This is one scenario and followed by one more last case. I will wind it up. What is the pediatrician's 10 pm headache as I call it? The first one is a straightforward dengue, the second one is a straightforward enteric, and the third one is a straightforward rickettsia. But they are not behaving the way they are supposed to. And 10 pm ke baad rheumatology so jata hai. So what's what's to be done? What's common to all the three of them? What do you think is happening? HLH. HLH, excellent, right? So what will be one test that you will do? It can follow many infections like we know. What will you do? Wrong. You will not restrict yourself to ferritin. Plus, please send the full HLH workup, which is ferritin, fibrinogen, LDH, triglyceride, CRP, ESR. Do not restrict yourself to only ferritin. Take home message. And being a rheumatologist, I don't give steroids to all of them. I will wait for 48 hours. If everything settles down, you will probably call it infection induced HLH, now self limiting. If the child worsens, you repeat the whole thing again. If things are worsening clinically and lab-wise, you may need to give the uh, steroids that this child needs, right? So this is just an important take-home message that you will encounter post-infectious HLH following mycoplasma, salmonella, tuberculosis, dengue, etc. Most of them, I call it POK. Goes to POK and returns back. You are lucky enough. Occasionally, you may need to give some steroids. Uh, I'll skip this because we may be discussing this in the panel tomorrow. Uh, this slide, uh, this would probably be the last slide. Yeah? This is very important because when Devang or Vijay goes on leave, who's my local? And this is Jitendra, who's the president of NMAP, always says, Tu mein ek tak tera local is solid matter. 
कुछ भी हो जाए हम सॉल्व में डर लेके रुकेंगे विच वॉज क्वाइट रैशनल एंड रीजनेबल बट देन माई न्यू हेड एक सिंस कोविड इज दो से कि दस से कि थर्टी से वो बता दैट आई इज थैंक्स टू कोविड इट्स बिकम रियल पेन वॉट इज दो से दस से तीस से सो आई विल ट्राई टू टीच अ बिट ऑफ मैथमेटिक्स टू द गुजराती विच इज पैराडॉक्सिकल कमिंग फ्रॉम अ मद्रासी <laughs> you know but don't visit your opd without revising this because this is somewhere in our pharmacology textbooks but it has to be in our you know subcortex every single time the steroid conversion as i call it remember dexa is the long acting half life of 72 hours methyl red red is intermediate acting and efcorlin is the i call it the ayurvedic icu rescue therapy dose you know most of the kids in shop will get this little bit of chutku hydrocortin come to you in fluoride shocks right so this 0.75 of dexa equals 4 of mps equals 5 of pred equals 6 of deflazacort which is dmd and equals 20 of hydrocortin remember this line and then start converting it this is just a very basic example of a 30 kg old दो से की दस से की तीस से यू नो तो टू एम जी पर के जी ऑफ प्रेड कम्स टू सिक्सटी एम जी ऑफ प्रेड विच इज अ वेरी हाई डोज इफ यू गिव टू एम जी पर के जी ऑफ मीथाइल प्रेड इक्वेल एंड डोज इज सेवेंटी फाइव एम जी ऑफ प्रेड विच इज इवन हायर एंड वेन यू आर थर्टी एम जी पल्सिंग इट इज रियली अ सुपर हाई डोज सो डज इट रियली मेक अ डिफरेंस आई एम सेंग दू गिव टू एम जी ऑफ मीथाइल प्रेड और थर्टी यू आर स्टिल गिविंग अ more than significant immuno suppressive dose of prednisolone equivalent so this is where my point is that numbers do not matter what's the rapidity that you need the steroids to work decides do ki 10 se ki 30 what do i mean by that i promise you this is the second last slide there is a genomic mechanism and there is a non genomic action you know not going into too much of pharmacology the genetics or genomic is the vicolon enters the nucleus does a bit of transcription translation story and then works it works definitely but it takes a while for the genomic one to work so that typical oral dose is what is the genomic but when i have a child with a shock i cannot wait for this to happen so the non genomic is when i use a higher dose which starts working as soon as it enters the cell without needing to reach the nucleus so that 30 mg per kg pulse works faster than the 2 mg per kg ka oral dose once you get that in your head emergency is called for 30 mg pulse a non emergency is routine and you may get away by giving oral doses of steroids right please do not use 2 mg per kg in rheumatic patients usually by giving the high pulse you should be able to control inflammation with 1 mg per kg per day let's leave the 2 mg per kg to the nephrologists as rheumatologists 0.3 to 0.5 mg per kg reach by 6 months you are happy tds dose works better with lot of side effects once a day in the morning less side effects but probably a bit low on efficacy which needs to be taken into picture and then taper from tds to pd and below 10 mg i am okay with giving a single dose this is the last slide i promise do me bolo sachu bara because this is one drug that all of you probably are going to hear more and more and it has got a connection with id people also the drug's name is anakindra anakindra is an interleukin 1 receptor antagonist not complicated right only drug which is not available is what we think but we do have resources to get access to and the commonest indication where you may as a pediatrician or an intensivist will want anakindra is hlh right a secondary hlh when you have lost everything that's a nice paper all of you can read this and you really have to believe and before reading the paper see this movie called the lazarus effect right so it's about how to get a zombie awake once the person has died so uh, this is this talks about the super hopeless kid who was brain dead with a flat eeg just gave as high as 48 mg per kg from a conventional dose of 5 mg per kg 
and this child just reverted back to full consciousness with very minimal neurological deficit, right? And the good thing is, Anna camera, unless the HLH intensive is start using, it will be probably a bit more delay to procure this in our country. And, and there are enough evidence to say that it doesn't have any major side effects vis-a-vis -vis worsening the infection. And secondly, it works faster and it gets out of the system faster. So safe drug, one injection costs about 8 to 10 thousand rupees. You need to purchase about 15 to 30 of them at a shop. But people working in the hospitals, if we start using this more and more, life will be easy. And this is the difference. This is a child with systemic GI who has Epstein-Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis, supremely sick. And what happens when you give anakindra and steroids is what I'm trying to show. The dramatic transformation that happened in this girl. And there are enough cases where kids just become completely normal. So I don't want you to use it for uh, rheumatological conditions, but at least HLH patients and Undu season in Gujarat is Kawasaki season for me. We have strawberries in Maharashtra in the winters. You have probably the resistant KD, who are even resistant to infliximabs and everything else. Anakinra is probably one of the drugs to use. So take home message. M for metaphysis, C metaphysial agents, think of malignancy, myelitis. We have talked about a new condition called chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. When you start seeing skin and bone, think of CNO. Viewers, I didn't get a chance to talk about, but we touched a few things about HLH in practical situations. Do the full HLH workup whenever you are thinking of the same. Remember the name Anna Kindra for the future. And last but not the least, do se ki, das se ki, tis se, depends on ki do minute bacha hai, tis minute bacha hai, I have enough time to treat the child. Perfect. So the... Thank you, Dr. Vijay, for making such a...